Thanks. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, so before, there we go. Before we get started, um, I just wanted to point out uh, for those of you that can read Chinese, uh, I'm, so if you've come to see Tsai Ming Liang, it's not the one, yeah, I'm not that one. Um, but I also wanted to thank um, Cosman and Anchi for the invitation and to the staff at Parasite for um, putting together such a, um, a comfortable um, and thoughtful, thoughtful conference. So uh, my story begins in early May 1918, as the hot season reached its peak in Bangkok, uh, when Prabhat Somdet Pramonkut Gajau Yuhua, or King Wachira Wood, decamped to a coastal retreat on the Gulf of Siam with his favorite male courtiers. Over the following days, the king and his retinue of handsome young men would retire to the beach and build elaborate castles out of sand. After returning to the royal residence at Dusit Palace in the new northern suburbs of Bangkok, the king ordered a miniature city built in the palace gardens and named it Dusit Thani Mung Prachatipatai, which might literally be translated as a heavenly city, the democratic polis. This highly detailed utopian landscape occupied a little under an acre, about 4,000 square meters, and was composed of over 300 miniature structures including fully electrified private houses, theaters, cinemas, banks, palaces, a regularly convened bicameral parliament, as well as a constitution, a police force, a fire department, a tax system, and three newspapers. After the king decamped to Payat Hai Palace in 1919, he took his model utopia with him. There, as urban model, mediated landscape, and theatrical stage, it became the center of a queer aesthetic regime that linked the, the king's prolific endeavors in architecture, literature, theater, fashion, and visual art with the training of a modern ruling class. So I'm using the term queer here um, at multiple levels to describe the ways that the miniature city's appearance often disguised deeper internal contradictions. In its turn of the century historical context, the word queer suggests the dislocated atmosphere of a Bangkok dominated by migrant workers and extraterritorial laws, as well as the unusual Alice in Wonderland-like spatial and temporal scales at play in Dusit Thani. Um, apologies for those of you that can read Thai. Um, the, something got lost in the transfer, um, so the letters are all out of work. Um, the scale model was both political tool and speculative play toy for Wachira Wood. He was attentive to the worldwide decline of monarchies in the 19th and 20th centuries, but thought that a parliamentary system of government could not yet be introduced at the scale of the nation. It needed to be developed in a smaller metropolitan context first, and so Wachira Wood considered Dusit Thani the model for a modern municipal government in which a new generation of leaders drawn from the ranks of the newly emergent urban classes in Bangkok could be trained. The early 20th century evolution of the term queer can also be used to refer to the ways that the intramale relations of the king's inner court disrupted the polygynous heteronormative atmosphere of earlier iterations of the royal palace. The model city can be seen as part of the development of a larger project undertaken after Wachirowitz's ascension, in which he gutted the inner city and repudiated key aspects of Siamese political culture, such as engaging in extensive marital alliances, employing male kin in positions of power, and displaying his masculine virility through the accumulation of wives and the production of children. While Wachira Wood's father, Jula Longkorn, uh, had framed his reign as an attempt to fuse old and new tendencies and develop a new system of government that was both modern and appropriate for Siam, he effectively produced a veneer of Europeanized styles over local practices, uh, as you see here. As a ruler who grasped the importance of aesthetics to political rule, Wachira Wood sought to further transform the city not only in its appearance, as his father had done, but in its social relationships, and to, de to decouple westernization from modernization. The model city was an important instrument in training which are its new ruling class in not only the machinations of running a modern city, but in the proper taste, dress, and behavior of its citizens. And then finally, the use of the term queer gestures towards the homosocial and homosexual bonds of nationalism that were cultivated by Wachira Wood at Dusit Thani. 
While assertions of the king's homosexual relationships remain speculative and cannot be corroborated by historical evidence, the leisure activities of the king and his inner court, which centered around Dusitani, sought to generate passionate sentiments for both the monarch and the nation that he represented. The historian Dam Sunton Wait remarked of Dusitani that one couldn't find a single housewife there, largely because men were expected to set up households together. In its most politically instrumental capacity, Dusitani functioned as the model hub of a new system that the king created in which ambitious courtiers from common or obscure backgrounds could ascend the ranks by developing close bonds with the absolute monarch. Getting an audience with Witcher was difficult, but it was much easier if one had a home at Dusitani since he frequently spent time there. Situated deep within the inner sanctum of the royal palace, of two royal palaces, However, Dusitani was also a utopian canvas that allowed Wichira Wit to experiment with modeling a form of nationalism based on queer social and spatial relations. The models, drawings, and landscape interventions produced for the miniature city sought to make the homosocial relations of Wichira Wit's nationalism appear natural. And it did this by situating an eclectic collection of architectural forms associated with the burgeoning concept of siwilai or, or civilization within uh, both a mediated and picturesque landscape. So in 1912, some six years before the founding of Dusitani, Wichirawut had published an English language essay in the Sayam Observer based on some earlier diary entries about Uttarakuru, uh, one of the four continents surrounding Mount Meru in the Tripum. Um, uh, I'm trying to figure out a way to briefly describe what the tripum is. The tripum is just um, uh, really an older kind of, um, based on older uh, thought systems, it's uh, the cosmology of the third worlds that can be traced back um, in Indic thought, like even before the Vedas, back to the Puranas. So the tripum would be the, the Thai version of this cosmology of the three worlds. But the description of Uttarakuru in the Tripum uh, contrasted with that of uh, Jambu, the continent in which human beings dwelled. So Uttarakuru is one of these four continents that set the base of Mount Meru, which is the center of the, the, the Indic cosmos. Um, Uttarakuru was an idyllic society populated by a race of people with square faces and lifespans of 1,000 years. They ate a kind of rice that grew by itself and had no chafe. They did not suffer disease and lived with an inexhaustible wishing tree known as the Galpapruk, which provided them with enough, with enough wealth that they had no need of private property. They practiced vegetarianism and did not kill animals. They also engaged in a kind of free love in which there was no dowry. So when women gave birth, the offspring were left by the side of the road to be cared for by um, the entire society of Uttarakuru in common. Reading the uh, Tripum at the beginning of the 20th century, King Wichiru pronounced Uttarakuru a utopia that predated Thomas More's. So uh, this is a diagram of the cosmology of the three worlds. Uh, that's Mount Meru in the middle. And then you've got these four continents surrounding it. You can see that in the plan on the upper left. Uh, while Wichiru Wood recognized the ideological importance of such utopian models in articulating the relationship between morality and manners, he also poked fun at the idea that a classless society might be realizable. By lumping together utopian and scientific socialism, Wichiru was thus able to dismiss any ideology that challenged private ownership of the means of production as a fanciful objective that would be impossible to, to achieve. The text, and indeed Wichiru Wood's early reign, was haunted by the specter of the 1911 Republican Revolution in China, which he denounced in this text, Uttarakuru, in Asiatic Wonderland, as a modish intellectual fad. In it, he's critical not only of uh, Sun Yixian, uh, or Sun Yat-sen, the first president and chief ideologue of Republican China, but also of Kang Youwei, um, the Qing court reformer who wrote the utopian polemic uh, Da Tong Shu. Wichiru was critical of the idea of collective child rearing in Uttarakuru, which was an idea actually shared by uh, Kang Youwei in the Da Tong, uh, da Tong Shu. Um, each person having no family ties would devote the whole of their attention to the community rather than have to take care of their offspring. 
The idea that the family unit would be eradicated sat very uneasily with Wichiruwut. So while Wichiru rejected the older polygynous relations that had sustained the inner court, he advocated for a new conception of familial ties. In the models of modern domesticity that Wichiru would, would rehearse with his male courtiers at Dusitani, a queer formulation of the family was necessary for the production of a nationalist ideology that positioned the king as daddy to his sons. The men of the inner court, or Nai Nai, uh, were Wichirowitz invented, if not biological family. He spoke about chupling, or raising them, and told them, I regard you as my children, and you must think of me as your father. When he rose in the morning, he announced, Daddy is up and awake now. At the same time, Wichirowitz rejected the polygynous practices of his forefathers. Dusitani became the hub of a new system that the king created in which ambitious and coincidentally, handsome male courtiers could ascend the ranks by developing close bonds with the absolute monarch through participating in activities at Dusitani, rather than by engaging in extensive marital alliances. To build a home in Dusitani required the permission of first the king and then an official in charge of public works. Homeowners invested time and money in decorating their model homes in order to win contests and ultimately to catch the eye of the king. Those who couldn't build their, ho their own houses rented shop houses or hongtao. Uh, rents as well as water and electricity bills were collected to improve the miniature city's infrastructure. Leftover money was sent to the Royal Navy, uh, the real life-size Royal Navy, not the miniature Royal Navy. Um, Wachirowitz's rationale was that a male courtier's allowance was traditionally frittered away on vices like gambling or prostitution, and so Dusitani modeled a new form of domestic behavior that benefited the state. The miniature city was striking in its attention to material details. The small buildings that lined its manicured streets were very thoughtfully articulated and highly decorated. They were illuminated at night with electrical lighting, and the landscape in which they were set was carefully manicured. Citizens of Dusitani were part of a privileged circle of the inner court who had secured permission from the king to build their symbolic homes within the miniature city. Plans were presented to an official in charge of public works after royal permission was secured. And then only after the plans had been approved could a house be built. As the city grew, homeowners tried to outdo one another, designing their model homes in order to catch the eye of the king. This contest was supported by a royal decree and reinforced by a committee who inspected the miniature city for maintenance and cleanliness. While the increasing attention to detail projected an image of elegance, it also created a rise in house prices so that a modest teakwood house in the early years of Dusitani cost 130 baht, but towards the end of King Wajirowit's reign, a minister's teakwood house was, more than more, was worth more than 3,000 baht. Uh, courtiers who participated in Dusitani as landowners soon came to understand the ways that value could be produced from land speculation as well as real estate investment, even at this reduced scale of the model city. So the architectural model has historically augmented political meaning and symbolized achievement and ownership. Um, this is uh, an example of a model that was made by, or ordered made by King Wachirowit's grandfather, uh, King Mankut, uh, sometime in the middle of the 19th century, shortly after Henri Mouho had um, discovered Angkor Wat. Uh, news of the discovery reached the court in Bangkok and King Mankut um, said, what is this, um, what is this uh, temple that's within you know, uh, the borders of the kingdom that I rule over. Somebody please um, send an army there, disassemble it, and bring it back to Bangkok for us. Um, so they organized an army to go to Siem Reap to take apart Angkor Wat and bring it back to Bangkok. But the people in the area um, basically killed them. Um, and then when news of that got back to the court, King Mankut decided, well, maybe I'll just send a, uh, um, a surveyor there and we'll just rebuild a scale model in the Grand Palace. So this is the, the scale model that exists there today. But for Wachira, the, the model did something different. It did more than stake a symbolic historical claim to a territory um, or even to a dynastic lineage. Um, it was also a pedagogical instrument that was used in an elaborate political theater that engaged the lives of his courtiers. Dusitani married the masculine attributes of the model as an exercise of spatial dominance in the urban field with the feminine character of the Victorian dollhouse as a model of the domestic sphere. The emphasis on municipal hygiene, order, and appearance was an extension of the private inner sanctum of the modern home. Yet women were absent from the primary unit of the household at Lusitani. In reforming the polygynous institution of the inner court, 
which era would redefine the heteronormative domestic conventions of Victorian culture. The homosocial relationships at Dusitani form the backbone of which era would's utopian nationalism, in which passionate feelings for the king could be projected onto the nation. It created a new spatial model for the nation in which the authority of the king was no longer confined to the ritual geometry of the mandala, but extended inwards to the domestic space of his subjects and outwards to the quote unquote natural landscape. Uh, so a word about the mandala. Uh, pre 18th century Southeast Asian polities like Angkor, Sukhothai and Ayutthaya imagined themselves as the center of complex geometric mandalas. The borders of the modern nation state, however, required a different formal approach. Dusitani proposed a model of the city in which the monarchy was no longer confined to the sacred cella at the center of the temple, as at Angkor Wat, but could be present everywhere in nature. In fact, Dusitani presented itself as more of a leisure garden than that of an organized metropolis. The garden was the ideal unifying form for which Erowitz aesthetic experiments in design, theater, and politics, and can be understood as a corporeal intervention that sought to engage all the senses. Both the plan of the city and its political and media culture sought to integrate life-size human bodies with the one to 20 spatial scale of the miniature built environment. And perhaps the most obvious indication of that is that the streets were large enough for human beings to walk through. Uh, this play in uh, non-human and human scales at Dusitani reflected the dissonant relationships between labor, nature, and capital in the new urban society of the early 20th century. The manicured gardens of Dusitani served as a tool for working out these relationships in space. The attempt to fit hierarchical planning within a garden setting underscored the historical relationship between urban planning and landscape design that had become increasingly central to both European capitalist development and architectural theory since the European Enlightenment. The naturalizing of urban conditions through the conventions of the picturesque reduced the city and its functions to that of a natural phenomenon. So as cities like Bangkok grew with populations that had left the familiar economic relationships of the countryside where values were produced through the agricultural husbandry of nature, they encountered a new urban economic environment where values were driven by the speculative values of mercantile and industrial capitalism. At Dusitani, the integration of life-size human bodies into a picturesque landscape of miniature houses produced a utopian disguise for the clash between Siam's formative urban capitalism and economies that were based on pre-capitalist or feudal exploitation of the land. The human-managed countryside, as well as the less cultivated forests that supported rural life throughout Siam during the late 19th and early 20th century, were rapidly being centralized, enclosed, and marked by canals, roads, mines, and plantations as part of the boom in real estate speculation and nation building, as well as the squeezing of commodities like rubber, tin, and rice out of the land to fuel Siam's recent entry into the world capitalist economy. Dusitani allowed the court to reimagine their empire as a picturesque utopian political community based on the idea of civilization or what they called siwilai. The approximately 300 structures at Dusitani belong to no single style or architectural appearance. The diverse building types and styles of Dusitani were driven not only by an interest in discerning the appropriate architectural form of a civilized nation among other nations, but in the transitional nature of Siam's construction industry and the nascent state of its architectural profession in the early 20th century. While most of the model buildings uh, were constructed out of wood, others were made of brick, mortar, and even concrete, which had become a strategic building material to the crown after the establishment of the Siam Cement Company in 1913. This eclectic historicism saw itself play out across four types of building at Dusitani royal and religious, government, entertainment at leisure, and private homes. Um, so uh, some of these buildings, uh, like uh, this one, what Tipatai uh, and the Royal Palace were built in historicist and regional idioms that referred back to the polity of Ayutthaya, um, rather than, uh, yeah, and building two of these important royal and religious structures at Dusitani with multi-tiered gable-hipped roofs and extended finials further established the idioms of the central region of Siam as standardized national forms. But they were included in this collection of colonial style buildings, suggesting a certain equivalence between both Siamese and European historicism. 
So other buildings like this uh, mansard roof uh, throne hall were a pastiche of historicist styles that were more difficult to ascribe to one geographic locale. This mix of Italianate, Gothic, and Second Empire elements was really indicative of both the global trajectory of the architectural profession and construction labor in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Just as the classical revivals were used in 19th century European metropoles and colonial entrepôts to articulate a political legacy that could be traced back to a largely imagined imperial Rome and Periclean Athens, this new eclecticism strove to define a new kind of utopian political community based on the idea of civilization. The question of what a civilized society looked like occupied Wachira Wood and the citizens of Dusitani. An article in one of the three newspapers, a Dusitani written under the pseudonym Royal Page, remarked that the term had been heard often lately at court and that those who were called civilized were people who had a good reputation, while those who were uncivilized were considered barbarians. The word was defined in the dictionary as, quote, the change in customs that is in order with other countries, but the author found this definition too constricting. Who, he wondered, decided which customs to change and whether what was popular for people in the whole world or in one country or in one individual was actually good for another country. In other words, is civilization a universal concept? Dusitani sought to define the appearance of the civilized city and the taste of its modern citizens through architecture and landscape design. A uh, three approach to building design reinforced the picturesque presentation of the landscape somewhere between the exotic and the familiar, Siamese historicist, European historicist, and what Thai historians have called uh, romantic, a play on transliterating the English words Roman and romantic. Um, so buildings like um, uh, what Tamatipatai and the Royal Palace that I just showed you um, were built in a regional historicist idiom. Um, uh, while others uh, drew on um, uh, a variety of Gothic revival and Second Empire styles to suggest a certain equivalence between not only Euro CMEs and European historicism, but between the colonial practices of Bangkok, London, and Paris in Southeast Asia. So the court in Bangkok is really thinking of itself um, as participating in the colonial game um, as as an imperial power and of colonizing the people that are around them. The publication of Royal Page's article on the meanings of Siwilai suggests that Dusitani was a highly mediated experience. Three life-size newspapers circulated among its citizens and members of the court, but the impact of the newspapers extended far beyond the walls of the king's palace. On the one hand, these newspapers were utopian tracts published during the flourishing of Thai mass print culture. They provided an opportunity for an imagined national community to read about its exploits and endeavors and place itself within the everyday life of the court, creating a confidence of community. Citizens could rest assured that their personal exploits were part of a larger story of Dusitani as it unfolded on the pages of the newspapers. These newspapers were also a guide to appropriate political behavior. The newspapers were the clearest indication of Dusitani's ambitions to train Wichirowitz Nainai into modern subjects. As might be expected of media that covered a miniature utopian uh, city with a citizenry only in the hundreds, Dusitani's newspapers did not have a lot of news to report. They often resorted to gossip about the citizens of the municipality to fill their pages. That most articles were signed with the names of avatars rather than the real names of courtiers compounded this problem. Because Dusitani's newspapers wielded influence far beyond the miniature city, however, citizens became concerned that the newspaper would expose them to other members of the court and inevitably the king if they behaved inappropriately. Um, these are two drawings by King Witcher Wood from um, uh, one of these newspapers. Uh, on the right um, is an illustration of the history of argument um, that shows the origins of um, uh, political persuasion. Uh, the drawing on the left illustrates um, a problem that the that plagued um, the miniature city was uh, these little houses were also kind of ideal domiciles for frogs. Um, so a lot of frogs would crawl into these houses and die and create this awful stench and then workers had to come and remove them. Um, but all of these suggest that Dusitani was the stage for a new form of political behavior and a living exhibition of a model city. The importance of the theater and exhibitions as instruments of instruction in the ways of the modern world is suggested by both the internal world of Dusitani 
and its placement within the palace grounds. So when Wachira would move to Payatai Palace, Dusitani was placed on the fringes of the palace grounds. And between it and the king's bedroom, uh, he built an Italianate garden called the Roman Garden around a very long pool. Uh, which Wut uh, was said to have sometimes used the pool to bathe in, but it was also the setting for theatrical productions in the evening. Steps at the western edge of the pool led to an elevated stage with two arbors and a small pavilion that served as a stage. So one can imagine which Wut, when he was not acting on the stage himself, observing the Roman garden from his balcony, with Dusitani uh, comprising an even larger garden in the background. The adjacency of his bedchambers, the Roman garden of Dusitani, suggests that these were all settings in which the king could exercise the political authority and command the kind of respect as a sovereign that he often lacked in the real world. And these settings also allowed him to experiment with new methods of governance, as he did in October 1918, when he called a meeting of the citizens of Dusitani to explain to them uh, voting. Um, initially confused by the concept um, his courtiers were like, why should we bother voting when you're the one that makes all the decisions? Um, which are what's nine nine eventually went on to create a constitution and a parliament for the miniature city in November, um, and then later in uh, July of the following year in 1919. And this is long before um, Siam or Thailand has its own constitution. So um, my conclusion, in architectural practice, the model is a tool that is made to understand space and to give instructions. The model is a kind of memorandum. At Dusitani, these formal aspects of the model overshadowed its critical intentions. In spite of its democratic pretensions, Dusitani was more of a formal utopia than a practicing parliamentary democracy. Its citizens admitted confusion when asked to make political decisions, but then developed rigorous systems for maintaining the city's order and hygiene in order to please the king. Motivated by a regime of appear appearances, Dusitani's citizens created a convincing formal utopia that had the appearance of a modern metropolis and all the institutional evidence of a municipal democracy, but which functioned politically still as an absolutist city-state. When Wichirawit died, Bangkok continued to expand, but the model city was dismantled. Wichirawit's successor, Pateri Pope, um, gave some of the model houses to the governor of Lampun, who exhibit them in the Provincial Museum. This is a small city up north. Payatai Palace itself underwent a transformation into first a hotel and later a hospital. Um, so Dusitani became a kind of um, tourist attraction for a while. Uh, which are what's utopian ideals would also take on a curious afterlife. The most important reincarnation of these was that um, Sayam's first national constitution introduced 14 years after Dusitani's by a small group of foreign educated military personnel and civil servants included one of Wichirut's former royal pages who worked to actually overthrow the absolute monarchy. Um, all of this points to the importance of the model of utopia as a critical element of ideological formation um, as well as uh, both as, as both a critical element of ideological formation and facilitating political change. The utopian model allows us to step out of the certainty of the time and place of the present um, to insist on what performance studies scholar Jose Esteban Munoz has called something else, something better, something dawning, a resource for the political imagination. Uh, the utopian model has historic, well, utopia itself has really historically been used as a tool of co-optation and false consciousness, as well as an instrument of emancipation. I want to suggest here um, that its potential for enacting social change has, lies less in its use as a model for building a better world than its capacity to demolish the stranglehold that late capitalism places on the speculative imagination. Um, I'll end there. Thank you.